Okay, so on, on, on the first part of this lecture, we're going to do recaps. Lots and lots of recaps so that you will know more about the functional dependencies and why it will be useful later on. Okay? So we start with the kind of the meaning of the functional dependencies. Again, it's basically just what uniquely identifies other things. Right? So an, an attribute an attribute A, if it uniquely identifies the values of the attributes B, that means uh, there is an FD of the form A to B. Okay, so that's what um, the functional dependencies mean. Um, so now we can define what is a super key. So a super key, it will uniquely identify the entire relation. At the very least, you will have this trivial super key, which is R to R. Okay, this is always true. Okay, and again, because we are, we are talking in terms of sets uh, instead of, of the actual table, so this functional dependency is trivially true. Uh, for tables, if you do not specify any primary key, that means there can be duplicate values. Okay? So table without any constraint is a multi-set. It's not a set. Okay? So now, with that, we can actually identify what is a key, or what we call previously as a candidate key. Okay, it must be a minimal set of super key. Okay, so how do you find a super key? Well, to find a super key, uh, you have a relation R. So what you have to do is simply break down R into every single constituent. Okay, so here, uh, we have the notion of what we call a power set. So if you still remember what a power set is, uh, so I, I'm not sure uh, what is being what is the symbol that is used in in one two three one, but the typical notation for power set is this. The power set of R is basically um, for any A which is a proper subset of R, A is in the power set of R. All right? So if you can specify what is the, po what is the power set of things, uh, so let's say you have A, B, C, the power set will be, there's A, there's B, there's C, there's A, B, there's A, C, there's B, C, right? And there will be two more. One of them will be the empty set, and the other one is R itself. Okay, so that's the power set. And the reason why it's called a power set is simply because the size of the power set is two to the power of the size of R. So it's kind of the power set. Okay? So do you all still remember the, the algorithm number one? The algorithm number one is to find the attribute closure. So if you can find all the power sets, excluding this, so this one is, is unnecessary, the power set excluding the empty set, then all you have to do is run the algorithm one, and then check if the result of algorithm one is exactly R. If the result of algorithm one is exactly R, that means whatever the left-hand side you, you use at, at the start is a super key. If it is minimal, means that you cannot remove any um, any member of that of that set and still make it to be a super key, then you arrive at a key. Okay, so that's how the algorithm goes. Okay, so I can. Luckily, we have this. There's this utilities algorithm. So let's say you have A to B, B to C. Okay, so from here, you can, you can kind of figure out that well, A to C must be implied by this um, relation. So you have A, B, C. So if you try to find the super key, the super key must contain A. All right, here you. Uh, it will contain A because from A you can get anything, right? So that any set that is a superset of a set, a set containing A is a valid uh, super key. 
if this is the set of super keys, all you have to do is to find the key. All you have to do is remove everything that is uh, super set of anything else in that set. Okay. So here, a set containing A B is a super set of A, so you can remove A C is a super set of A, A B C is a super set of A, so you can remove that. So when you arrive at a key, the key is only A. All right. Uh, prime attributes is basically just um, find all the key, union them, and that's your prime attributes. Now, there are a few properties that might be beneficial for you. One is this. You notice that, uh, actually from here, you also will notice something. Note that A does not appear anywhere on the right hand side. Okay? Because A does not appear anywhere on the right hand side, any key or any super key must involve A. Okay, so I can I can give you another example. C does not appear anywhere on the on the right hand side. If you start from an attribute without C, you can never get to C. So that is why C must appear in any super key. And this is the proof. I think I need to remove that. All right, so there are two keys, AC and ABC. Now uh, two super keys, AC and ABC, okay? So C must appear because it is never on any right hand side. Okay, because it is never on any right hand side, you can never arrive at C. Okay, so you need C to start from the left hand side. Okay, so the key is just this, the prime attribute is just AC. Okay, so now if you have D here, again, D does not appear on any of the right hand side, so it must appear as a key. If I say C to D, then the super key will be something like this. Okay, uh, A and C never appear on the right hand side, so it must be part of a key. Um, for this particular one, actually, let me, let me try to figure out something. Let's say something like this. Ah. Okay, uh, let me see. A, B to C, and B, C to D. I think I should have a... Um, okay, uh, this is a good example. Because for this one, uh, the super key, you have ABD, BCD, and ABCD. But ABD and BCD are uh, non-overlapping. Okay? The intersection is not null, but the intersection is not e exactly one of them. So if you arrive at something like this, then both of them are key. Okay, so if you look at the key, it contains both of them. Which means that the prime attributes will be the union of all this, of these two keys. So you have A, B, D. You have B, C, D. If you union them, you get A, B, C, D. That's the prime attributes. Okay, and that is from the meaning of the prime attribute itself. There is kind of a reason why prime attribute is interesting. Okay? In fact, what we really want to know is what are the non-prime attributes. Think about it this way. Non-prime attributes are attributes that does not appear in any key. That means these are the attributes that are redundant. Okay? You can always arrive at that particular attribute from another attribute. And also, non-prime attributes means that you cannot use it to uniquely identify any of the R. These are your, um, so if you have A to B, ah, if you have A to B, okay, and you know B is a non-prime attribute, A is a prime attribute, then what you will get is basically B is your additional information. Think about it this way, if I have, um, 
if I have an entity called book, right? Book is identified by ISBN. That means the ISBN is part of the prime attribute. The rest of the attributes will be the non-prime attributes. Okay, that's the identifying uh, attributes will be your prime attributes. So that's the only thing you need to know about about the the entity itself. Because if you know the identifying attributes, then you will know the rest by the by the functional dependency nature. Okay, so that's why we are interested in, in the non-prime attributes. Okay? And the computation of this only relies so far on the algorithm number one, which is the computation of the attribute closure. Okay, and then we also learn about the Armstrong axiom with the extended version. So the extended version adds two more things, which is the union and the decomposition. Uh, but these two can actually be derived from the basic Armstrong axiom. Okay? And the derivation of the union and the decomposition is part of the next week tutorial. There's two properties that we are interested in. It is sound and complete. Okay, so if you keep on applying, so for soundness, if you keep on applying the Armstrong axiom, okay, all the functional dependencies that you will get will be uh, implied by F. Right? Uh, for completeness, if you try to find a certain uh, functional dependency that is implied by F, then what you can do is you can keep on applying Armstrong axiom. Eventually, you will arrive at that if it is implied. Okay, so these are two important properties. Without these two, algorithm one doesn't work. Okay, especially without completeness, then algorithm one doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so because of the completeness, we can then kind of use the Armstrong axiom to find the closure of the functional dependencies. Okay, so F plus uh, can be derived solely by applying Armstrong axiom again and again until you cannot apply anything anymore. But this is not the most efficient algorithm because unless the question is asking you what is the uh, F plus, then uh, you are typically not going to be interested in the F plus. So again, if you want to find the super key, you don't even need the F plus, you just need the attribute closure. In fact, if you can find the attribute closure, you can find the F plus. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, again, you start with R. You compute the power set of R. And then you start from here. Start from any A, which is a proper subset of R. Okay, well, basically what it means is, is that you start from A, which is an element of power set of R. You try to find the attribute closure. You will arrive at some form of A to A plus. Okay, A plus is the attribute closure. And A plus can be a lot of things. Right? Then you can use the extended Armstrong axiom of decomposition to derive the rest. If you can find this, then you can derive any A to B where B is a subset of A plus. And if you can derive that, then you can derive F plus. Okay, so that's why the the closure of FD is typically not interesting because you have the maximum size of this two times two to the power of n times two to the power of n, and how do we arrive at this? The size of the left hand side is two to the power of n, the size of the right hand side is two to the power of n. And the worst case, you have everything. Okay, or if you want to be very very pedantic, you get you get minus one, two power of n minus one times two power of n minus one. Because you will always exclude the empty set. Okay, so that's why we arrive from here at the attribute closure later on. Okay, so this is what we wanted to, typically this is what we wanted to do. We want to find the, the minimal set, all right? Because keeping track of all the um, functional dependencies are not really it's not really a, a good way uh, 
to keep track of things, especially when things, most of the things here are trivial. So this one is not trivial. This is trivial, this is trivial. Okay? Keeping track of the trivial things are not important. And for this particular one, you can decompose it into, into the trivial part and the completely non-trivial part. Okay, so typically what you want to do is you want to find everything that is completely non-trivial. Okay? And it still and it still have the same information as as your initial f. Okay, and you can always arrive at that using the attribute closure. So this is the attribute closure, and this is how we derive the attribute closure. We still use the Armstrong axiom. Okay? But we, we use Armstrong axiom in a very unique way. We start with this notion of invariant. We start by saying that um, let's say that my result is this, theta. What I want to do is I want to make sure that A to theta is always implied. Okay, so I start with A. So theta is equal to A. So A to A is always implied. It is trivial by reflexivity. So now what I want to do is I want to expand the theta. I want to expand this to be as large as possible until I arrive at an A plus. So how do I expand this? Well, based on the property of invariant, I have A to theta. Okay? And now with this, if I find that B to C is true, such that B is a subset of theta, then I will always know that by reflexivity, this is always true. All right? We apply reflexivity. And because B is a subset of theta, by reflexivity, this is true. So this is true. And then we found out that, well, this one is true. Because uh, this is, is taken from the, from the original set F. Okay? So now what we'll have is that we have this tree formula. We can use transitivity twice. The first transitivity, we get A to B. And this one comes from A to theta and B to theta, uh, and theta to B. We arrive at this, and then you have B to C. We arrive at A to C. Now we, have, we, now we know that A can go to C. Right? And by the union rule of extended Armstrong axiom, that means we can extend the theta with this. Okay, so what I've been doing is just applying the extended Armstrong axiom in a way that I don't have to compute everything. Okay, so that's what the algorithm one of attribute closure is doing. The main thing here is that you maintain the invariant. That this one is always implied. So at the end, you have to restore the invariant, and then by the nature of this, it is implied. Okay? Because we have just found a sequence of Armstrong axiom that proves this. Right? So any questions? Okay, so from there, you can actually get the, the actual algorithm itself written down. There's a property that we, we want to have that is nice, and that is based on the property of the invariant, then any decomposition will be implied. Any decomposition of this will be implied, all right? Because you can always have a sequence of things. All right? In particular, we know that this one is, is we know that, that this one is implied by this. Okay, by the transitivity of this, A to B, where B is a subset of, of A plus, is always implied. This one is reflexivity. And then the maximum size 
of theta is definitely going to be just n, right? Where n is the number of attributes. So this is a much more compact algorithm. And there's this nice property. If you apply algorithm one, you can always decompose it into two parts. One is the trivial part, and the other part is the completely non-trivial. Okay, assuming that this is not already trivial. If it's already trivial, that means this one is empty set. So A to empty set, which is again trivial. Okay, so assuming that, that uh, A to A plus is non-trivial, you can always decompose things into two components. Okay, and we will use this uh, probably next week when we talk about the, the normal form. Okay, so the other thing that, that we want to do is the minimal covers, and we want to do this simply because keeping track of all the, um, the functional dependencies is not efficient. You want a smaller set of, the smallest possible set of functional dependencies, or not exactly the smallest possible set, but at least it's a minimal set. You cannot remove any of these uh, functional dependencies anymore. Okay? And if you can do that, and still maintain that these two are equivalent, then all you have to do is just enforce the minimal set, the minimal covers. Okay? And minimal covers, in fact, is used when we talk about the third normal form. Okay, so we talk about redundant attributes, and the way we compute redundant attributes is that based on the property of redundant attributes. So I'm, I'm writing this in a different way. We let F1 to be this. So you have the common part, which is G. G is common on both sides. But on the right part, it is different, okay? So we want to make sure that A, whether or not A is redundant. Okay, if A is redundant, that means F1 is equivalent to F2. Okay, and why can we say that? Because not using this, okay, so this one is, is not present there, not using the capital A still gives us the same closure. So that's why A is redundant. Okay, and the way we, and the way we, can, we can do this is um, we can find the, the closure of A. Trying to find the closure of A. If it includes B, okay, then that means you can imply this. If you can imply this, that means you don't need the original one. Okay, so that's, that's the essence of, of removing redundant attributes. The redundant uh, FD is, is slightly more complex because you cannot start with F. We want to check if F and G are still equivalent by removing this. Select any one of the functional dependency. You check whether the functional dependency is redundant or not by checking whether not using that still gives you the same closure. Okay, so you start with G. Can you imply A to B? If starting from G, you can imply A to B, then you don't even need A to B. Okay, so that's the basic step of the checking for redundant FD. But you cannot start from F, you need to start from G. And G is F minus A to B. And this is why in the second part of the algorithm two, you will find this form with respect, you find the attribute closure of A plus with respect to F minus uh, A to B. Okay, so any questions on this? So this is the reasoning behind the two algorithms that we have, the attribute closure as well as the minimal cover. Now we look at schema decomposition. Okay, so this is a precursor to next week, which is about normal forms. 
Okay, so to arrive at the normal form, you need to be able to decompose a schema. And then there are a few things that we want to maintain while we decompose schema. Uh, one is what we call the lossless decomposition, and the other one is what we call the dependency preserving. Okay? So first, what is a decomposition of a schema? Okay, so a decomposition of a schema is basically just saying that, well, I'm, I want to break this down into fragments. You have R. You want to break it down into fragments. Let's say R1 and R2. There are certain properties of this R1 and R2 that you need to maintain. One is that uh, R1 should typically be simpler. Okay? Uh, here, I use an alternative. Um, I'm using an alternative uh, definition, which was used previously in the previous semester. So it is not strictly simpler. Okay, if it's strictly simpler, what I'm going to say is R1 must be a proper subset of R. Okay, but this is a very strong condition. Okay, so I'm just going to say that it's it's typically simpler. So I allow R1 to be equal to R and still call it a decomposition. Right? So again, it depends on what you define by decomposition. Uh, so in our module, we, we define decomposition as it is a subset. It, is, it need not be a proper subset. So that's the first. Uh, that's the first property of a decomposition. The second property is that no attributes should be missing. Which means that if I, if I union R1 with R2, I should get back R. Okay, I should not just remove things without being able to get the attribute back. Okay, so that's what a decomposition is. And how do we perform decomposition? Well, if you arrive at a, at a very big set at the start, so this is all your data which is a very big table. If you want to split it, there is one relational algebra operation that you can use, and that is projection. Okay, so uh, decomposition is basically your projection operation. Okay? Now with this, we arrive at actually two ways to describe uh, a database. Okay, so your database can be your fragments, and then your entire data will be the join of all that. So you have a view created from each of the individual fragments. That's your entire data. The other view is that your database consists only of single table, which is your entire data, and you can create each of the fragments by actually performing a decomposition. Okay, if they are equivalent, then you can actually do either one. But there's an advantage of doing the fragments of of actually keeping the fragments in the database. One is that you arrive at a um, smaller set of data because you remove all the duplicate parts, right? But there are disadvantages of having fragments. The disadvantage is that if you have a lot of join operation, it will be very expensive to reconstruct your entire data set. Okay, so it's kind of a give and take uh, thing. Now, not all decompositions are useful. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to have a useful decomposition. There are two properties that we want to maintain with respect to um, functional dependency. One is that it must preserve information. So what does it mean by preserving information? Well, uh, Remember the, 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 the view that we discussed earlier. So this is a view. Okay, so this, this is your entire data set. If you have fragments here, from all of this, you can reconstruct this. All right? So that's what a this is what it means by preserving information. This is all your data, all your possible data sets. Okay? And you can still get that back even after you decompose 
the data into smaller fragments. Uh, the second one is with respect to the functional dependency itself. You want to preserve the functional dependencies. Okay? And this is useful because uh, the functional dependencies is maintained by doing a primary key. Okay, so how do we maintain functional dependency? Well, if I have two attributes here, A and B, and I know that A uniquely identify B, I will set A to be my primary key. Okay? So that's, uh, that's how I can maintain uh, the FD. That's how I can, I can capture the FD within the database. If I also have B to A, then what I can do is I can set one of them to be in primary key and the other one to be non now and unique. Okay, that's how I maintain uh, the functional dependency. Now, if I have another if I have another table with C and D here, and let's say C can go to D, so C is the is the primary key in the other table. How then do I maintain this functional dependency? Because this is crossing tables, right? Because this is crossing tables, I cannot set A to be a primary key on the other table. But if it preserves the functional dependency, then I don't even need to do that. Okay, so that's what preservation of, of functional dependency means. I can maintain a functional dependency that was originally to be across fragments to be maintained just by maintaining each of the individual functional dependency in each of the fragments. Okay, I will give you an example later when we talk about this. Uh, so preserving information is what we call as a lossless joint decomposition, and preserving the functional dependency is what we call as a dependency preserving decomposition. Okay, so let's have some exercises. Uh, is this a valid decomposition? Okay, so to check a valid decomposition, you have two properties. One is that it must be uh, somewhat simpler, and the other one is that you can get back all the attributes. Okay, so to say whether or not this is a valid decomposition, all you have to do is find that, that you, you prove those two attributes. Okay, so yeah, so this one is a valid one because R1 is simpler than R. R2 is simpler than R. The union of those, the union of those you get back ABC, which is R. So again, you, you look at this, it will still be a valid decomposition, okay, because you have AB here and you have AB here. Okay, so AC here, so you get A and C. Okay, so it's valid. If you union them, you get ABC. Okay, this one, is this a valid decomposition? Yeah, so again, based on, our, based on our definition, this one is somewhat simpler. Even though this is actually exactly the same as this. But our definition says that R1 is still a subset of R. All right, and if you have this, then whatever you're doing here, as long as you don't add more attributes, it will definitely be a valid decomposition. All right, then what about this? Okay, this one is definitely yes. Okay. So this one. So notice for this, you are missing C. So this one is now valid decomposition. Okay, so that's, that's what schema decomposition is. You just have to check two properties. Whether... The, each of the fragment is a subset, and whether the union of all the fragments give you back R. Okay, so now let's have a proper meaning of the lossless join decomposition. So if you consider any schema, R, and then you, you just consider one decomposition of it, it decomposes into N fragments, we have a kind of a natural join operation, right? The natural join operation is this, based on the relational algebra notation. 
uh, and remember what the natural join is doing. It, the natural join will look at all the attributes that are the same, and then it will just make it equal on those. All right. So it, it's a it's a cross product where the selection is uh, implied. So for a lossless join operation, when you perform the natural join, you will get back R. For any possible instance R, uh, lowercase r, for any possible instance lowercase r, if you do a natural join of all the fragments, then you will get back this exact relation. Okay, so that's what it means by by the lossless join. Okay, so you preserve that information. So this happens before. In um, in one of the tutorial, one of our ER diagram is not actually a lossless join um, decomposition. Okay, and 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 what happens if it's not a lossless join is that if you look at the lemma one here, the first lemma, if it's not a lossless join, you actually get back more. Okay? You get back more tuple than you originally have. So it's not like you, you lose data. You actually get more data. But by, by having more data, you actually lose information. Okay? Because information is kind of stored in the relationship between the, the attributes of the, of the tuple. Right? So don't think of a name as... as, as so don't think of a lossy name as something that you're losing the, the, the data itself. No, you're not losing the data. You gain more data. But by gaining more data, you are losing information. Right, so, yeah, so here, what Lemma 1 says is that by, by performing this natural join, you will actually arrive at a superset. Okay, so that's why you get more data but you lose information so let me try to find the let me try to find the tutorial E R E R T E R was five or four. I forget. Let me check. Okay. Um, okay, I need to find. Ah, this one. Uh, you have the ternary. You have the ternary relationship here, uh, w as opposed to this circular thing. Guess on the on the right hand side. You have the ah okay on the right on the on the right hand side we have this decomposition kind of decomposition okay so you have your your original data set you decompose it into entities and relationship so each of those will become a table if you perform a natural join on this you actually get back more data if and only if, if what you want to capture is which part is used by which project and supplied by which supplier. If you want only this triple, this triple will be lost if you decompose it this way. And that is what that was the main essence of this tutorial. 
question. All right? But at that particular time, you don't really have the tools necessary to fully evaluate this. Okay, so this was the, the example that I was giving. You do not know which supplier supplies which part to which project. Because if you perform a natural join, you get all the possibilities. Okay, but you do not know which one is which. So yeah, so this design loses that information. Okay, so if you're still confused, try to uh, revise this, this tutorial, tutorial three. Okay? And it hinges on, on one particular um, consistency constraint is that what we mean by information is that we want to, to maintain the triple supplier project and parts. This is what we want to maintain. In our big table, we want this to still be the uh, primary key. Okay, if you want this to still be the primary key, then design B will lose th this information. All right? Okay, so that's the definition of a lossless join. It might be better if we have an example of what is a lossless join. Okay, so here, this is a lossless. This is not a lossless join decomposition. Okay, and the reason why this is not a lossless join is well, you have this originally. You arrive at this. So where does the rest of the data come from? Okay, so that's what what tutorial three was uh, giving you as well. In fact. Uh, let me show you this one was this one wasn't originally there and um, this one wasn't originally there okay so a non lossless join gives you more data it doesn't preserve that information this is our original information you do not get back this you get more All right uh, the losses join example will be this. If you decompose AB and AC instead of AB and BC, so this one the decomposition is AB, BC. If you decompose it to AB and AC, then yes, you get back only the original one. Okay, so this is the effect of a losses join decomposition. Now, in fact, this, if you try it with any possible data, Right, you will always get back this. You will always get back the this particular result. It will always be a lossless join. Okay, so any questions? So we have two two examples here. One is not a lossless join because it adds more rows, and the other one is a lossless join because you get back exactly the same row. Now the difference between the two is that if you look at the union, or if you look at the intersection of the attributes, you get back A. Okay. Now A is the primary key over here. That means it will always be unique there. So if you join only on the unique parts, you will get back uh, the original one. All right. So that's what, what, what we are abusing over here. There's a theorem that states that if you look at the intersection, and the intersection is a super key on any one of those. Okay? So you look at the R1, intersect R2. If this one is a super key, okay, so either this one goes to R1 or this one goes to R2, which means that this one is a super key on either R1 or R2, then it will always be a lossless join decomposition. Okay, so now if you, I'm not going to give the proof for this, but the intuition is captured by these two examples. We do a kind of a case analysis, 
if you have this, A goes to B, then you just look at, at whatever A can give. So A1 must be different than A2, right? And here also A1 must be different than A2. So A1 and A2 must be unique. Once you join them back together, if you join only on the unique parts, then you will always get back your original. Okay, that's the main intuition. Because remember what is the definition of a natural join. The natural join will, will make everything that is common. This is everything that is common. All the attributes that is common is made to be equal. If whatever it is you made to be equal is guaranteed to be unique, so how do you guarantee it to be unique? It is guaranteed to be unique if it is a super key. Okay, so that's why uh, this natural join will give you exactly your original um, table. Right? Now if, 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 on the other hand, I arrive at this, okay, so I do not have this, uh, I do not have this property A to B and, and A to C. That means whatever I'm joining can be duplicated because it is not guaranteed to be a super key. If whatever I'm joining, so the, the, the intersection, if whatever I'm joining is not guaranteed to be unique, then I will get duplicates. There can be some table that gives me duplicates. Not all table, but some table can give me duplicates. Okay, so that's the main intuition behind this theorem. Okay, and this has a very nice corollary. Okay, so remember what I said, if you simply um, do a decomposition on this, right, so if you simply do a decomposition on this, you will always get back, uh, you will always get a lossless joint. Okay, so how do we get this? Well, simple, right? We know that this is true, right? And you decompose based on this functional dependency. What it means is that if you try to get the intersection, the intersection is only A, okay? So you have A is common on both sides. B is not common, okay? So A is the only common one, and then we have this by definition. So then again, it must be it must imply this, all right? So this one, AB, is exactly your second relation. Okay, so if you only decompose on this, then you will always get back uh, losses join decomposition. Okay, this corollary will be very, very important later on. And now, what does it mean to perform this decomposition? The decomposition on a particular functional dependency. What it means is that now this A becomes a key. Because A becomes a key, this functional dependency denotes either an entity or a relationship. Okay, so that's what this functional dependency uh, entails. Okay, and that's exactly what we will want next week. We want to make sure that whatever decomposition we're doing kind of map into our ER diagram uh, example, okay? So to do that, if you, if you can find what are the functional dependencies, you need to make sure that every decomposition you do will, m will give you either an entity or a relationship. Now, the second theorem is an extension of the theorem one is basically if you wanna do multiple uh, decomposition. So, uh, the intuition behind the theorem too is basically something like this. If you have R, okay, you want to decompose into three parts. You can have R1, some intermediate R prime. This one is R2, and this one is R3. What it means is that there is a way to decompose this where each of the level decomposition is a lossless joint. Right? So you can sub you can you can decompose the fragment further. If your first decomposition is losses join, 
and then you decompose the fragment, and the fragment is still lossless joint, then all the decomposition is a lossless joint. Okay, and the proof of this is actually quite trivial because um, this, the natural joint of this gives you back R. The natural joint of this gives you back this by the property of a lossless joint. All right? So yeah, uh, we're using, we're using the, the, this theorem and, and corollary to actually try to find an example of whether we can have a lossless joint decomposition. Okay, so now this example, again, I'm, I'm giving you three decomposition. So I cannot just use, I cannot just use theorem one. Okay, because theorem one only works for two. There is actually an algorithm that works on an arbitrary number of relationship, or, or relations, but I'm not, we're not going to use that, that algorithm, okay? It will just complicate things. So what I'm going to show you is what will happen if, if um, I want to check if a decomposition of this three is lossless joint or not. So what I have to do is I have to find an intermediate, an intermediate version of a fragment. Okay, and there are three possible intermediate fragments. Uh, my intermediate fragment can be this, this, or this. Okay, if, if any one of those is a lossless joint, then I'm done. I can stop uh, my search because there is at least one possible intermediate that gives me a lossless joint decomposition. Uh, so we'll just do a check for the first one. The first case, this is actually not a lossless joint because this one is empty set. Okay? And an empty set cannot go to either R1 or R2. Okay, so then I, I have to try the second case. The second case, well, it turns out that it's actually a, a lossless joint decomposition. If I use this intermediate one, then I, I arrive at the losses joint. Now, the main thing about this is that once I figure out this proof, or if I give, if I figure out this example, if I if I know this intermediate fragment, then I can draw this. Okay. This is how the decomposition goes. This is the intermediate fragments. This is my final fragments. R1, R2, and R3. Okay, and, and notice that for each of those, I'm only decomposing based on F. Look at my F. This is inside F. This one is inside F. This other one is also inside F. Right? So there's a very nice property. And this comes from the corollary one. Right? So there's a connection between the theorem one and the corollary one. Okay, and just to show you that, that this relationship still uh, persists somewhat, then I can continue with, this, with, the, with the third case. Okay? So in the third case, what happens is that if I draw it back again, if I draw the diagram back again, this is AB, it, it appears here, CD appears here, CE and A appears here. Okay, for this one, for this case, I can choose either one. I can choose either to decompose on C to D, or I can choose to decompose on C, E to A. I will arrive at this. All right? So, this is the nice thing about the losses joint decomposition. So, if I'm giving you, uh, let's say, four relations, then it might be better to just check whether there's any decomposition that are using this. Okay? This and only this, because it doesn't make sense to check on, on, on a lot of other things. It does not guarantee losses join. But if you only use the F, in particular, if you only use the, the completely non-trivial F, then it is kind of uh, almost guaranteed to always give you the losses join, if there exists such a combination. Okay, and again, like I said, we can stop after case two because of this property that it, that that you just need 
to check for an existence of, of one possible decomposition. Okay? But the, the other case, to prove there is a lossy join, it is very hard because you have to check everything. Okay? And that is because of this property. There exists, uh, there doesn't exist such a decomposition D. Okay? And if, if you bring in the negation, what you get is for all D. Okay, so for all D, you get a lossy decomposition. So again, this is a very hard problem because you have to check for all possibilities. Okay, so lossy join is harder. But corollary one can be used to guide your decomposition. Okay, so that's why um, I'm giving you that, that diagram. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, now the other part is the, the dependency preserving decomposition. And to do this, we need to figure out what we want uh, first, right? So you have, you have a, a long list of functional dependencies, F. Not all of the F, not all, not all of the functional dependencies in the original set F, capital F, will be useful. Because once you decompose it into fragments, A, B, and C, D here, A to C, it's kind of useless here because you cannot enforce A to C. It exists on different tables. Okay? So what we want to know is, is what, what are the functional dependencies that we can still enforce on each of the fragments. Okay? And, and the way to do that is, well, this functional dependencies that exist here, that we can enforce over here, can only involve all the attributes that appears within this table. If you have a left-hand side to right-hand side, then what it means is that the left-hand side must be a subset of this fragment, and the right-hand side must be a subset of this fragment. Okay, that's, those are the, the functional dependencies that we, can, that we can capture. And that's basically what projection means. Okay, it must be in F+, plus, and it only involves everything, it only involves the attributes, within that, that, that particular um, relation, okay? So yeah, so we need to know what projection is. So let's have an example, this. Uh, so C to A, okay, so you, you only have this, F. Is C to A, firstly, is it an F plus? Okay, so we can try. So C to B, yes. Yeah. So C to B, B to C. So, so we try to compute C plus whether A is in C plus. Okay, and unfortunately for this one, A is not in C plus because A is not in any right-hand side. So this is not true. If this is not true, then the, the, the FAB and FAC is definitely not going to be true because it's not even in, in, in F plus. Okay, so A to AB. A to AB is definitely an A plus because we have A to B. B to C is definitely an F plus because it's here. A to C is definitely an F plus because it's here. All right? So now, A to AB, is it an FAB? Well, is it an F plus? It only involves A and B, so yes. But it contains C, so it cannot be this. Okay? B to C? Well, B to... Uh, C is not in AB, so this is going to be this. B is not in, in AC, so this one is going to be this. Right? So this one is not here, but it's here. Right? Now, the last example is very, very important because A to C is not in original F. Right? It is not an original F, but it is implied by F. It is an F plus. Right? And in fact, once you, you decompose the, the fragments, 
if it is a dependency preserving, this one is preserved. All right. So that's the, the 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 major thing about this dependency preserving decomposition. Now this can still be preserved even though it may happen that your decomposition does not involve AC as a single table. Okay, so I will show you one example where it may occur that you have uh, you have a function dependency that is not in the original f it is not in any of the it is not in any of the of the table of the of the fragments but it is still going to be enforced okay and that's the magic of uh, the dependency preserving decomposition and it comes down to the way we define dependency preserving decomposition okay so it is basically that well you know that for any um, for any projection it it must be a subset of, of f Right. At the worst case, the projection is exactly the same as F plus if and only if you have F R. Right. So this is one property that we, we, we always have because if you project on everything, then you basically get back the F plus. Right. And the other property is that well. Um, you have this, so it only involves the attributes in A. So now we 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 can do. Uh, we can have an algorithm. We can have a way to compute uh, any F A. By using these two properties, well, we must first compute this F R. Right. Once we compute F R, we filter out anything that involves anything other than A. Okay. Uh, so first, you can always start with F plus. Compute F plus, filter out everything else that contains anything other than the attributes on on either the left hand side or the right hand side. But we can we can do something smarter. We can control the left hand side. Okay. So we want to figure out F A. We can control what will appear on the left hand side. What appears on the left hand side should be an element, so let's call it A prime. This must be an element of the power set of A. Right? So once you get the A prime, which is an element on the power set of A, then you just figure out A prime plus. So once you get the A prime plus, the last thing you need to do is a prime plus may contain things may contain an attribute that is not uh, part of a. Yeah, it may contain attributes that is outside of this particular set of attributes a. You just have to intersect with a, and you're done. Okay, so what does it mean is what this one means is that you apply the decomposition rule such that you only use all the attributes that appears in A. So that's how you compute. And that is basically our algorithm. Our algorithm, for the first one, we initialize the theta, the result to be empty set. Now, this B here is an element of the power set of A. B is an element of a power set of A. So you can compute this. You can compute B plus. How is algorithm one? You compute B plus using algorithm one. You remove everything that is irrelevant. Remove everything that is irrelevant, and you put it to the result. Right? Well, not not put it to the result, and then you say that well B. B can go to whatever this is, and that's basically it, right? So computing projection. It's simply an application of algorithm one. It's simply an application of attribute closure. But we want to do that in such a way that we remove anything that is irrelevant. Okay, so that's why attribute closure is very, very powerful. It is, it is used to compute a lot of things. 
Yeah, so that's, uh, this is the mapping. This part is considered any here, which is coming from the power set of A. And then you compute the B plus itself. So you get the B plus, remove anything that is redundant. You get back um, a functional dependencies that only appears in FA. Right, so let's have an example. So this is what you start with. You want to compute uh, FAB. You have this. You have this F. You start. You always start with a. You always start with an empty set, and then you compute A plus. So A plus is a subset of of AB. Now again, you you always ignore the empty set. So then you arrive at ABC. You remove C, because C is not. Uh, part of AB, then you have this. Okay, so again you compute B plus, remove C, then you get this. You compute AB plus, you remove C here, then you get back this. That's your FA. Okay, if you if you don't care about those um, trivial part, then you can non-trivialize it, or completely non-trivialize it. If you Make sure that everything is completely non-trivial. What you get back is A to B, B to A. That's it. All right? Now, B to A does not appear in the original one. But it is implied because B to C, I think I used the wrong. Wait, wait. Yes, I think I used the wrong example for this. It cannot be B to A. There's no A here. So this one is this. Yeah, my original example was this one is A. Uh, yeah, so, sorry for that. Uh, so this one B to B, AB to AB. Okay? So A doesn't appear on the right-hand side. A cannot appear on any of the right-hand side unless A is on the left-hand side. So if you want to trivialize, if you want to make this to be completely non-trivial, so you, you make every FD non-trivial, and then you remove everything that is trivial. So you get A to B as FAB that is completely non-trivial. All right? I'll correct this later. So yeah. So if you want to find FBC, again, uh, the method is always the same, so you will get this. All right, but in this particular one, you only get BC, BC, so you don't have to remove any. You do not have to intersect with anything that is redundant. Okay, so again, why, why do we want uh, dependency preserving decomposition? Because of projection. Projection gives you the table, each of the individual table. And you can only enforce an FD if it's either a primary key or a candidate key, which is not now and unique. And because of this, you cannot enforce a function of dependencies that cross the table. But the question is, do you even need to enforce that in the first place? Can you imply that instead? Okay, so that's what dependency preserving decomposition gives us. Without actually enforcing any of the any of the FD that crosses the boundary, we can still enforce those functional dependency by only de by only enforcing the the functional dependencies that appears in the in the fragments, right? And that is because dependency preserving decomposition is saying that the union of all this. The union of all the projection is equivalent to F. <coughs> because it is equivalent to F, you do not have to perform a join first before uh, enforcing the FD. You can simply enforce the FD on each of the individual fragments. And then you get back F. Okay? So there are a lot of ways to check for this particular statement. Uh, 
the union is equivalent to F if and only if this is the, the symbol for equivalent all right or if and only if the closure of those two is equivalent or we said that the union implies F and F implies the union okay so what implies mean is that for every FD here it is implied by the union okay now in particular look at the last one look at this we have two possible checks the union implies F the F implies union and that is the way to check whether whether this is equivalent now look at only this right hand side and then remember how we construct the projection the projection must first appears on F plus right F R1 the way we construct F R1 means that F R1 every individual F D in F R1 must first appear in F plus so this is a subset of F plus now obviously this one is trivially true right because each of the individual one each of the individual FRI is a subset of F plus so it is always going to be implied by F anyway and if you union them you don't get new information so the algorithm so I will show you the algorithm later on the algorithm to check whether it's a dependency preserving decomposition all you have to do is check this particular one you don't have to check anything else because this one is trivially true because every fragment every projection on, on every fragment is a subset of F plus okay but for now let's let's look at this magic uh, we want to ask whether this is a dependency preserving decomposition right okay and then you can you can look at the steps FAB is that FBC is that the union is F exactly F so then is equal right the, the closure must be equal <coughs> okay and this is the part where I say that well the, this one is not in FAB nor in FAC but it is in the union it is in the F so yeah so this is this is an example of that right so what I want to show you is the A to C it is still maintained okay so I want to show you the A to C this FD is preserved by only checking on this particular part so how do I how do I show this well let's give let me give you a violation this is a violation right so the violation says that uh, so A to C for the same A I get different value of C okay, so this is this is definitely a violation if I insert into this this big table my original table before the before decomposing I will definitely catch this um, I will definitely catch this violation but what I have is that I insert into each of the individual fragment this is what I have all right but notice that this one for the same B I get different C and that violates B to C so I have a violation here and this violation implies this violation right so it means that I cannot insert uh, any value that violate A to C even though I cannot technically check this FD directly but each of the fragments in combination will check for this violation for me okay so that's what dependency preserving decomposition is okay now the other one the other example this is this illustrate kind of a common mistake when you talk about this uh, dependency preserving decomposition so look at FAB well 
A to B basically is in FAB. But when you look at FBC, because instead of BC, we have AC here. Then I just say that, well, this one is, is basically empty, right? Nothing. Okay, so the union of this is definitely does not preserve A to C. Okay? So what this one implies is uh, if, so A to C is not, a to C is not preserved, and uh, what it will do is I can insert a violation. Okay, so let's try to insert a violation of this. Because I say that this one is not implied. Well, again, I, I give you the same example. Same value of A, different value of C. And what the individual one will, will, will give me is that uh, this doesn't really have anything doesn't give me anything. There's no functional dependency that applies on BC. Okay? So I cannot find any violation here. I cannot find any violation there. So in fact, this one is all correct. This one is all correct. But this one should not be there. So for a non-dependency preserving decomposition, I can insert a violation like this. This is an example of a violation. Okay, so any questions? So this is what I talk about when you want to do the checking, you just have to compute, you just have to check for this one. Because we can have a lemma that says that this one is always true. Right? The, the lemma is kind of, of, of trivial. This one is called lemma. So, so F is always entail the union of the projection. And because of this, we just have to check for this particular one. Okay, and how to check for this particular one? Well, the simplest way is we compute the union. The union of each of the projections. Okay, so first, you compute the projection. When you get all the projections, you compute the union of the projection. And then for every functional dependency, F, within F, you check whether it is implied. How do you check if it's implied? You use algorithm one. Again, the property of algorithm one is that, let's say F is A to B. Okay, this is implied if and only if B is in A plus. I will always need the algorithm one. Okay? So yeah, so that's, this is why I, why I have to check. I need to check for all the possible functional dependencies in F. I compute, I compute uh, the closure not with respect to F, but with respect to the union of the projection. For all possible I, it must be implied by this. And if there's no violations at all, if everything is implied, then yes. This is a dependency preserving decomposition. If at any point in time I could not find this, then it does not preserve. The decomposition does not preserve dependency. And that is basically my algorithm. Okay? So compute this. Okay, so and then you make the union. Once you make the union, this is the part where you use the algorithm one. Algorithm one is used everywhere. Attribute closure is the key to this CS2102. Okay? Now, this, this comes the subtlety. Um, let's say you want to implement this algorithm. And let's say you are kind of proficient with Python, right? Since you're proficient with Python, then well, let's say you want to, you create each of these as an object, as a class. You overwrite the usual notation. So if this is of a type, uh, let's say you create a type called F, right? You create a class F, okay, you create a class F, 
Now, what you do is, if A is, a, is of type F, you want to check that, you want to check this. Uh, you overwrite, let's say you overwrite the, the, the symbol, you overwrite the symbol this. Okay, because, because you cannot type, you cannot type this in a program. Because you cannot type this in a program, let's say you overwrite the operator. Uh, the operator for this, this one means that this B is a subset of A. If you try to implement this, uh, typically, so this is something that, that can be very common error, is that uh, when we have this, we typically just say that well, A is greater than B. Okay? Simple, right? But this is wrong. This is not equal. Right? And the reason why it's not equal is because B is not a subset of A. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is not a subset of A. You cannot transform it to A greater than B. Right? Because these two can be incomparable. So what it means is that I can I can give this counter example a b is not a subset of b c, but at the same time you cannot say that well a b is a superset of b c. So negation works differently when we talk about a partial order set. And in this particular case, it's a lattice. Lattice is a partial order set. So if you try to implement this, please be very, very careful. I spent an entire day debugging this uh, when I created the, the algorithm. Uh, the, when I created the, the website. When I created this, it, that particular mistake cost me an entire day of debugging. Okay, so here, Now we can try some of the examples. Okay, this one is dependency preserving. I can check this. Okay, so let me check this. A to B, B to C. My relation is A, B, and B, C. Okay, so this is how I write if I want to check dependency preserving uh, decomposition. I need to give the decomposition, and to give the decomposition, I need to, to use semicolon to differentiate the decomposition. So if I check dependency preserving check, then yes, it preserves. If I change this to AC, this one does not preserve, okay? But I did not give any counter example. I can give a counter example of what is not preserved, uh, but I did not do that. Uh, FD projection. FD projection, you can do the same BC. The FD projection of this is simply this. Okay, so notice that I'm writing, this is this part, right? In this part, I'm, I'm saying there's empty set. What I meant is that it is empty set with respect to, non, to completely non-trivial. I do not care about everything that is trivial. Because everything that is trivial is always there, right? I don't need to, to capture it. So this FD projection algorithm will give you everything, including everything that is, um, free, com, uh, that is trivial. But when I do my own steps, I don't even have to care for those that are trivial. So you can make it faster, but I only care about whatever it is completely non-trivial. And that is, should be enough. So yeah, if you want to compute attribute closure, the relation means the attribute. So A here is, the attribute closure is A, B, C. Okay, so that's how you use the algorithm. Or that's how you use the, the web page. Uh, there's utilities, yeah, utilities not exactly that. Uh, equivalence check. Equivalence check, how do you check if two things are equivalent? You just do a, Brute force check. 
two things are equivalent if um, if okay this one is, is kind of long ah. so two set of FDs are equivalent if uh, so you have F you have F1, F2 you want to check if they are e they are equivalent so you check for every A which is a subset of the projection uh, of the power set of F1 right you compute you compute the closure and then you're also computing the closure for every B that is in the power set of F2 you compute this and then you get a set of all this if this is an equivalent set then these two are equivalent uh, set of FDs okay so just do brute forcing okay that's, that's kind of uh, well not, not the simplest way but it, it is a guaranteed way to solve things now if you want to be um, if you want to make it faster then you just check whether this one uh, implied this and whether this one implied this okay so you do exactly the same thing as what we did um, in the you do exactly the same thing as what we did here in the algorithm so this algorithm So th this algorithm, the union, what you're checking is that the union of F R I for all I implies F. Right. This is the part. This is the, exactly the component where you do the checking of implication. Okay, you just repeat this and reverse the role of F and G then you have basically checked for equivalence okay so that's that's basically uh, how you check for equivalence so any questions okay so that is what decomposition is decomposition uses the the technique that we get from functional dependencies next week we will talk about certain decomposition that have nice properties decomposition that have a very nice properties are what we call a normal form okay so we will learn about two very basic normal form which is the bcnf and the third normal form we're not going to learn about the, the rest of the normal form now in total if you study the literature there are about 10 different normal forms okay so we're, we're only going to cover four out of the ten and it will be very very important that you analyze your project whether they they actually uh, are in either BCNF or 3NF and if they are not give a reason why they are not okay so yeah so any questions if there's no questions then I'll see you next week It's not, yeah, well, uh, okay, so. Uh, it is a decomposition because each of the fragments is, is a subset. Yeah, but is it possible? Uh, no. No, right. No. Because if I join them, never join them together, there might be nothing like this. Wait, actually, wait, hold on. Yeah, not. So it depends on whether it's a covering or whether it's covering or or. Basically, if they don't have any intersection, I forgot the term. But if they don't have any 
Mm. It's a valid decomposition, but 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 whether it's covering or overlapping, right? Um, I think. But they so so let's say at at the at the purest form of it, yeah. right? Um, at the purest form of, of an is a relationship, uh, the attributes of the subclass should be exactly the attributes of the superclass. So they should match everywhere. Right. So the natural join on that, there will be nothing that is equal. So you get the if it's non-overlapping, yeah. if it's non-overlapping, then it's empty. Yes, and it's actually different from what you yes. Yes. We have more. Like in some cases, they have they have less. Mm. But it is allowed. So. Uh, so in that sense, this one is is. But this is okay. So this one is not actually a decomposition because it's not projection. Oh. Okay. Okay. It's not based on the projection. Oh. It's based on selection. Okay. So it's not exactly a decomposition. There is a there is a relationship. It's not a projection. It's a selection. So, so this row, this row, and this row is this. This row, this row, this row is this. Mm -hmm. You should not use serial. So, so, so yeah. This. Right, so so then why do you need the ID here? So what so what is the type of ID in the first place? Yeah, so so why do you need that? Right, but again it's if you don't have ID, like me, like it's a bit Yes. Yes. 